Hey, hey guys, welcome back to chapter nine. Today we will discuss the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Stay tuned. We are coming toward the end of our discussion on the sacraments. As we will recall, there are seven sacraments. The first three, baptism, confirmation, or Eucharist, they make you a Catholic. They make you a Christian, so we call them the sacraments of initiation. The next two, confession and anointing of the sick, they heal the soul. That we call, therefore, we call it the sacraments of healing. Matrimonial holy orders exist to serve others. We call them the sacraments of service. Today, we're going to talk about the last one, holy orders. Before we dive in, into the sacrament of holy orders, and we talk about the priests in the Old Testament and the priests in the New Testament and the differences, It'll be good for us to first clarify what exactly is a priest. Well, a priest is one who serves as a mediator between God and man. What is a mediator? A mediator is one who goes in between. Imagine there are two parties that are distant or that are fighting or trying to come up with a, some kind of compromise. A mediator is the one who works between both of them. So a priest goes from God to man and from man to God. Now, priests offer sacrifice on behalf of the people to God, usually for four reasons. The priests offer sacrifice. Priests and sacrifice go together. Priests offer sacrifice to beg forgiveness from God, to intercede to God, to offer thanksgiving to God, to worship God. But not only does the priest speak to God from the people, uh, the priest also speaks to the people from God. He goes in between as that chief liturgist, as that person offers sacrifice, as that one who speaks on behalf of, he's the mediator between the two parties, between God and man. The first priest that we see in the Old Testament is Adam. Adam was created by God to be the high priest, and he was meant to live forever. Remember, he was given the gift of immortality, but he lost his office in some respect. He lost that gift of immortality when he sinned in the garden. He was kicked out of the garden. Now, after Adam, we're going to see that there are other priests who come later between Christ and Adam. Now, often through the Old Testament, we're going to see this phrase, the Son of Man, in the Old Testament. You're going to see it with Ezekiel. We see it with the other places in the prophets. The word Son of Man, phrase Son of Man, is better translated, maybe, as Son of Adam, as Son of Adam. And this was a phrase that was used to describe the high priest in the temple. So just as Adam was meant to be the high priest but fell, these other priests who will serve in the temple later on in the Old Testament, like Adam, offer sacrifice. They're meant to offer sacrifice. Now, every time we go to Mass, we hear in the Roman canon three names, Abel, Abraham, and Melchizedek. So the priest has consecrated the bread and wine. It's now the body and blood of Christ. We're presenting Christ's sacrifice to the Father, and the priest says this, Father, be pleased to look upon these offerings, what's on the altar, Christ's sacrifice, with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the sacrificial gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. What is this? Well, in the Old Testament, there are all kind of priests. One, one of the first priests after Adam was Abel. Abel. Abel was one of the sons of Adam. And Abel offered to God a pleasing sacrifice that was fragrant and acceptable to God. Well, his brother, Abel's brother Cain, was jealous and killed Abel because of that sacrifice. Another sacri priest we see is Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a mysterious figure who encounters Abraham. He's the king of Jerusalem. He offered bread and wine and sacrifice to God. Another person we see in the Old Testament is Abraham. Abraham was called by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac to God. But God stopped him. Uh, the angel stopped him before he offered that uh, sacrifice of his son. So we see that there's a, a, a union between sacrificed and priesthood, sacrificed and priesthood. So we first had Adam, the high priest, but he fell. We had his son Abel. We had Melchizedek. We had Abraham. Finally, we get to in the Old Testament, Moses. Remember, Moses was sent by God to free the people from slavery. But one day, Moses on top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments. Meanwhile, everyone else is down on the bottom of the mountain waiting for Moses to get the Ten Commandments from God. And while they're down there, they're so impatient that they begin to build a golden calf, and they begin to worship that golden calf. 
And now there's one group of people, though, that did not worship the golden calf, and that was the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levi. So God is angry at the Israelites for worshiping the golden calf. So God, through Moses, appoints the tribe of Levi to serve as the priestly tribe, as the priestly people. So that the priests in the Old Testament, after this point, have to come from the tribe of Levi. They have to they get it that they, through their blood, through their father, through their grandfather. If their father was a Levite, if their grandfather was a Levite, then they were a Levite. And Levites served in the temple. They offered sacrifice, sacrifice of bulls or goats or pigeons or grain. They interceded on behalf of the people to God. They prayed to God on behalf of people. They asked God for forgiveness of sins. So the Levites, from this point on, from Moses on, the Levites served as the priest uh, for the Israelite people in the Old Testament. There is a fundamental problem with the Old Testament priesthood. It's just not effective. It never opens heaven for us. It never forgives all our sins. The problem is the priest in the Old Testament is mortal. He dies. He's a sinner full of sin. And what he offers is finite, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats. We owe God injustice and infinite repayment because we offend him through our sin because he is infinite. How can the blood of bulls and goats even come close to repaying an infinite debt? And so we don't see a true priesthood until Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the true priest in the New Testament. Priest, because he's both God and man. Remember, Jesus is 100% God who takes on flesh and is 100% man. One person, two natures, God and man. Therefore, he's the perfect mediator between God and man. He offers the perfect sacrifice on the cross where he willingly, out of love, obeys the Father, out of love for us, dies on the cross for us, that one perfect sacrifice. He offers that perfect worship to the Father humbling himself and obeying the Father by dying on the cross for us. So he offers in that one perfect sacrifice, Christ the true priest, the true sacrifice, offers us true forgiveness of sins, opens up heaven for us, has our worship and prayer now become effective because they're through the blood of Christ, which is infinite. The blood of Christ is infinite value, infinite power. And so all the Old Testament, all the priests of the Old Testament, whether it's Adam or Abel or Marquisedec or Abraham, the tribe of Levites or Moses, all these priests of the Old Testament foreshadow Jesus Christ. Remember, we learned about the word type. Type, and, and, and we're talking about the Bible means something in the Old Testament that foreshadows, that's an image that for, uh, shows and points forward to something to come. And so the priests of the Old Testament, which were imperfect, point to the blood of Christ, the Christ, the true priest, the true sacrifice that comes in the New Testament. So if Jesus is the one true perfect priest, if he offers the one true perfect sacrifice, then why do we need priests plural? Why do we need Father Molossal, Father Metrojohn, Father Bob? Why do we need priest if Christ is the one true priest? Well, it's because God is a divine artist. He does everything out of his pure love and wisdom. And he likes to have things participate in other things to show forth his beauty and splendor. So, for example, God could have raised you without parents. He could have had you poof pop up at seven years old. He could have poof have cereal pop up on the table every morning. Poof, the milk and the toast would be there also, right? But instead, he doesn't. He uses the beautiful interdependency of so many people to help each other, and, and it shows forth God's wisdom, right? So this, your mom and dad had to raise you, they had to feed you. Someone had to harvest the wheat to help become the cereal from the from the field, someone had to process the wheat to make it the Honey Nut Cheerios, right? Add the honey to it. Someone had to milk the cow. Someone had to deliver the milk from the cow. Someone had to buy the milk for, uh, from the cow at the store and bring it home, right? All these different inter intricate levels that shows forth God's wisdom and beauty that make an interdependence uh, between us and God. And so think of an example. If, if I take a, a pencil and write an essay, I am the primary cause of that essay. I'm the one who thought of the essay. I'm the one who organized the thoughts on the one to put the words to paper. But in a certain sense, the pencil, in a, in a way, participates in that writing of that essay. It's a secondary cause. Well, in the same way, God has us participate in his priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. He has us participate in the power of Christ's priesthood. So when a Christian is baptized, a lady are baptized, they participate in Christ's priesthood in a lowercase way, lowercase priest meaning they can offer sacrifice, they can pray, it's effective. So when a Christian, a baptized Christian prays or fast, it's much, much infinitely more effective 
than a non-Christian because they're in the priesthood of Christ through baptism. Now, capital P priest, those who receive holy orders, actually can offer the mass itself. Those capital P priests who receive holy orders, the priest and the Christ become one. We say the priest is in persona Christi, the person of Christ. So when we confess our sins to the priest, we're really offering, giving our sins to Christ who's in the priest. We confess our sins to Christ who is in the priest. When the priest offers sacrifice to the mass, it's really Christ offering the sacrifice to the mass through the priest. God is using these different beautiful intricate levels to feed us. Just like your parents fed you and nurtured you and trained you naturally, so too Christ has uh, his priest participate in saving us, feeding us spiritually, and forgiving our sins through the blood of Christ. Now, holy orders involve different steps. We can also call it different orders. So if a young man wanted to be a priest, he would first become a porter. He would be ordained a porter. Ordained means he entered into the order of porters through a sacred liturgy. And a porter had the keys to the church, so he would unlock and lock the church. He was someone who was proven trustworthy and that was prayerful. And after he proved himself as a porter for a long time, he could then be ordained a lector, meaning that he could read and sing at mass. And then after a while, proving himself as that, he could be ordained an exorcist into the order of exorcist. And then he could be entered into the order of acolyte, which was uh, uh, the most important server at mass in, in an instituted fashion. And finally, after many years of proving himself and studying theology and scripture, he could be ordained a subdeacon. A subdeacon was the first of the major orders. It's where he took his vows of celibacy and permanence. Now, these four minor orders and that one major order of subdeacon are not very common today, but they were very important in the history of the church. We see this all the way from the very first documents of Christianity, the second, third century. We see this order, these steps on the way to the priesthood. Now, today, when we hear about holy orders, people mainly, mainly mean the last of the major orders, that is deacon, priest, and bishop. But it's good to know that in the history of the church, the tradition of the church, there were minor orders and even one major order before the step of deacon, priest, and then bishop. So let's now focus on deacon, priest, and bishop. We'll first go over deacon. If you take your Bible out during your small group and go through Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, you'll see why the apostles first ordained deacons. The Christ established the diaconate and, and the apostles ordained deacons to help with serving the poor. And so deacons are servants. They're ordained as servants through holy orders. They're not ministerial priests. They don't offer the sacrifice, but they do help serve through charity. And they also help serve by assisting the bishop and the priest. Now a deacon distributes Holy Communion. He can assist at marriages. He can proclaim the gospel, not only at mass, but also preach the gospel outside of mass in the streets. A deacon is meant to go out to evangelize the world, to bring them into church. And he can preside over funerals. In certain cases, he can even do baptisms. Now, we have to make a distinction between a permanent deacon and a transitional deacon. A permanent deacon is someone who is not on the path to become a priest. They're only going to stay in that first level of being a deacon. And these deacons obviously can be married. If their wife dies, they're not able to marry again because no one in the history of holy orders ever married after they were ordained. Now, a transitional deacon is a man who studied to be a priest. He's first ordained a deacon before he's a priest. That's called a transitional deacon. Let's go over a priest now. Now, a priest is ordained in the person of Christ. He's first ordained as a deacon, as Christ the servant, and then he's ordained in Christ the, the priest, Christ the head. He's the co-worker to the bishop. He helps the bishop with his task. And so a bishop, priest... He teaches, he sanctifies, that means makes holy, and he governs, he rules. He's meant to preach and to teach. He leads the sacraments. He leads, he celebrates the sacraments. He offers the sacrifice of mass. The mass and confession are the bread and butter of a parish priest. Right? This is where the priesthood really shines and offering the sacrifice of mass and hearing confession, forgiving sins. Now, there are two different types of priests. Diocesan and religious. Diocesan is what kind of priest I am, and most priests are around here. A religious priest is one who takes extra vows of poverty, uh, extra so deeper poverty, and deeper obedience, not just to the bishop, but also deeper obedience 
to his superiors. So like the Franciscans or the Jesuits or Dominicans. Now the last level, the highest level is bishop. A bishop has the fullness of the priesthood. Actually, when a bishop celebrates mass underneath his chasuble, he wears the, the vestments of a deacon also, showing that he has all the orders within him. And he is the high priest of the diocese, the prophet, meaning he's meant to preach the gospel. And he's the king in the sense that he's a ruler. He's meant to govern all the parishes and all the dioceses and make sure the poor are fed and make sure that the gospel is preached and make sure that the people are sanctified. So the name bishop actually means overseer. He is the manager, the overseer over all this area. Now, over all the dioceses he's in charge of. Now, each of these levels, deacon, priest, and bishop, receive an indelible mark on their soul in the sacrament of holy orders. Now, a priest can celebrate more sacraments than a deacon, and a bishop can celebrate all the sacraments. Let's wrap up with one more slide. First of all, who can be ordained, a priest, a bishop, or a deacon? In order to be ordained, one must be baptized, of course, one must have received the sacrament of confirmation. And finally, one must be a male. The last part, being a male, is controversial in some parts of the world. People ask, well, why can't women be priests? Well, it goes back to the very will and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who chose 2,000 years ago to only ordain men as priests, only ordain men as bishops, only ordain them as men as apostles. Now, during the Christ's time, it was not uncommon for the pagans around their area to have female priests in their pagan religions. So it would not have been strange for our Lord to choose women to be priests. Think about who, who's most deserving to be a priest would have been Mary herself. Mary who's full of so much grace and holiness. But Jesus doesn't choose any women. He only chooses men. Why is that? Well, first of all, we have to go back to the Garden of Genesis, the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis. Remember that we see the devil in the form of a snake, a serpent, a giant serpent, uh, tempting his wife Eve, Adam's wife Eve. Now, Adam, whose job is to guard the garden, whose job is to guard his wife, fails. The fact that this giant serpent comes and tempts his wife proves that he was not doing his job. In a certain sense, he was being slothful. He was not protecting. And so it's fitting that the new Adam, Jesus Christ, who ordains men in his image and, and, and the image of the new Adam of Christ should have them only be male just because the first male failed as we protect. He sets aside men to protect through the sacrament of holy orders. It's Christ's will itself. That complementarity between man and female is part of the poetry, the wisdom of God himself. Now next, for someone to be ordained, there must be a divine vocation, meaning that someone can't just choose to become a priest or deacon because they want to have status or privilege. No, it must flow from an interior undeserved call that wells in the heart from God. God chooses through his wisdom certain people to these sacrament of holy orders. And it must be interior, but it has to be proven exteriorly to the bishop. And this is why there's a testing period to prove over time in many years, yes, indeed this person has a call. The church verifies the interior call exteriorly. And there must be time of preparation for a priest. He goes to seminary for six to 12 years and gets an undergrad and master's in philosophy and theology. For a deacon, he goes for five years to preparation class to prepare for his diaconate ordination. Now celibacy, priests, especially in the West, have to be celibate uh, in order to be ordained. Celibate means not married. And so marriage, as we know, is written into the very nature of our humanity. Our bodies bespeak our vocation to marriage. So a man should have a natural attraction to want to be married, a natural attraction to want to have kids. But someone who has a vocation chooses to lay aside that natural good, that natural vocation for a higher call. Now, if someone's called to the priesthood or diaconate and chooses not to follow that call, it would not be a sin. But guess what? They're not going to be as happy as they were meant to be because God has a divine plan they're no longer following. And it's going to have consequences. Less people might go to heaven. There might be negative consequences because they're not following God's call. Just like Mary, she did not have to say yes to, to, to be the mother of God, but she said yes. and th Therefore, we have redemption through her saying yes. So too, uh, when someone's called to holy orders, if they say yes, it brings about more grace to the world. Now, celibacy is a beautiful 
gift that helps the priest to be more intimate with Jesus, that Jesus is a spouse. He's living for heaven. And therefore, his celibacy is a sign to others that our final goal is not this life. Our final goal is union with God in heaven. And so celibacy is a beautiful gift that we have to protect. And this is why only a man who desires to have a wife and kids can be a priest. Because there has to be that sacrifice in order to be a priest. If someone doesn't have an attraction to be have a wife, doesn't have an attraction to be kids, then he cannot be a priest because there's no sacrifice there. Now, for deacons, permanent deacons, uh, they obviously can be married when they are ordained. However, if their wife dies, sadly, after ordination, then they are not allowed to marry. Because in the history of the church, everyone has received holy orders has never been allowed to marry after holy orders. Now, what about the matter, form, and minister of holy orders? As we know, the baptism, the matter is water. The form is, I baptize you in the fall of the Holy Spirit. The minister is a bishop, a priest, or a deacon, or anyone in emergency. Well, in holy orders, the matter is the laying on of hands. If you look at the left side of the screen, you see a man be ordained a priest by a bishop. The bishop is laying hands on him. Well, that gesture of laying hands goes all the way back to Christ, all the way back to the apostles. There's actually a beautiful website called catholichierarchy.org. You can Google it. And it shows how every bishop who had hands laid on him and that train, that lineage of uh, hands being laid goes all the way back to the apostles. Now, the form is a special consecratory prayer where the bishop calls upon the Holy Spirit. And the minister must be a bishop. Only, only a bishop can give the sacrament of holy orders. Now, what are the effects of holy orders? First, it gives a sacred power. That means it gives an ability, a faculty for the person who receives holy orders to fulfill their job. It also gives it a double mark. Remember, baptism, confirmation, they leave a tattoo, a brand on the soul that's permanent. So even if someone says they're no longer baptized, guess what? They still are because baptism is permanent. So too with the priesthood and the diaconate and the bishop being a bishop. The holy orders leaves a permanent brand on the soul that cannot be removed. So even if sadly someone would leave the priesthood, guess what? They're still a priest eternally in the eyes of God. Now, the graces, uh, special graces are given to the sacrament of holy orders. The grace is to preach. The grace is to, lead, uh, to offer the sacrifice of the mass for priest and bishop. The, the grace is to serve. The grace is to uh, lead. All these special graces needed for the offices of bishop, priest, and deacon are given in holy orders in each uh, sacrament. Now, finally, there's a principle that's very important called ex opere operato. What does that mean? It means through the work to already work. It's a Latin phrase. And what it basically says is, Look, a priest can be a saint, a priest can be a sinner. If sadly a priest was a, a horrible sinner, his sacraments would still be valid because the work already worked, except for operato, it has already been done, the work of Christ on the cross. So therefore, even through an unholy priest, baptism, confirmation, uh, the Eucharist, confession, are still valid when they have the special faculties from the bishop. Now, God prefers, though, to work through a holy priest, right? Because through a holy priest, more grace will enter the world and more uh, change will happen in the souls of people. But even through an unholy priest, the sacraments are still valid. All right, guys, let's remember to pray for priests. We need priests. We need deacons. We need bishops. Pray for the sacrament of holy orders. Pray that God sends out more laborers into a vineyard, into his vineyard to lead and guide the church. God bless you all, guys, and have a good week. <laughs>